Hey guys, a couple of you guys asked me questions yesterday and day before, and I spent my morning before work looking stuff up for you and my lunch break, and here's what I found. People are wanting to know, can social media really censor us like that? Like say the White House press secretary had her Twitter account blocked for posting news. And so it came out that, well, Twitter must not like this party and they're trying to protect Joe Biden. You can't do that. Can they? Excuse me. And the short answer is, yeah, absolutely they can. Here's the legal precedent behind that. So Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all those guys are private entities. They are private services and you sign an agreement to use it. You give them full control. You allow them to data mine. You allow them to track you. They can get your credit card numbers. They can get your phone numbers. They can get your blood type. Anything that you put on the internet anywhere that's remotely linked to them or one of their partners, that's theirs. You voluntarily gave all that stuff up to them. Extremely intrusive and total violation of the Fourth Amendment if the government were doing it. But remember, you signed your rights away and you agreed to it with your terms of service contract thingy that you signed to get in there. So those constitutional rights no longer apply, sort of. Let's take a look at some of this stuff, all right? Uh, just because it's a constitutional right does not necessarily mean it's going to stay that way or that it's fair or it's just freedom. We're allowing these guys to run until they abuse their freedom and then we step in and regulate it, which is the point that we're at. So let me walk you through this process and where we're going with all of this stuff. May 28th, 2020, the president signed an executive order on preventing online censorship. Where, If you read the order, it gives a lot of examples of Twitter, of Facebook, of different social media filtering out things that they don't like, exactly what we're talking about, and saying, hey, you can't do that. But the problem is the executive branch doesn't have the power to make laws or regulate things like that. All they have the power to do is make sure their branch is not cooperating with it. So the executive order, in a nutshell, just says no money will come from the executive branch and be involved in these platforms in any way. If we figure out that something of what we're doing is helping Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, whoever, then we're going to cancel that. And I need everybody in my executive department to take a look at all of the stuff you're doing and make sure you're not involved with any of these guys. It's kind of the extent of the authority of that one. So who would actually have the authority for some of this stuff? Well, these are, these are constitutional issues, so this goes to the Supreme Court. Let me throw a couple of cases out here for you that we've seen recently. Why are they censoring speech to begin with? Well, you have the Force versus Facebook case a while back where um, Hamas was actually found to have accounts on Facebook. Facebook was not blocking them out. And several Hamas people got together and organized, and it resulted in the death of several Americans. We also have several other uh, ISIS and some others, you guys probably remember this, were linking up on Facebook. Facebook was saying, look, we're not promoting these guys. In fact, under the Federal Communications Act, let me see if I can put my number is, 47, U.S. Code 230, it says that we are not liable for what other people post. Not only were they legally correct in allowing uh, ISIS and Hamas to gather on Facebook, they were also held not liable under U.S. communication laws in an effort to keep free speech open and flowing. And so after that, they started going, okay, so we have the right to, but just because it's our right to doesn't mean that we should. And so Facebook, Twitter, all these guys started setting policies regulating what they think was hate speech. What are you going to do about hate speech? Uh, Facebook says they're not going to ban it completely. If you're quoting someone else, I'm not responsible for what someone else said, so you can quote it hate speech, as long as you're saying, hey, this guy said that, and I want you to recognize it as hate speech. And that's how a lot of these nasty articles get passed around on Facebook. If you just come out and say it directly, well, they can go, hey, this is hate. But if someone else says what you said, there's a loophole, and you can post that, right? Twitter will just come out and block your account if they consider it hate speech. Now, who gets to decide what it is? They do, because it's a private platform that you signed away your rights to participate in. This is how this kind of stuff works, right? What role does the federal government play? None. First Amendment, they can't touch it. 
Let me get you some more Supreme Court cases to talk about here. Prune Yard Shopping Center versus Robbins. It's 1980. And a group of students show up at a small, at a like a mall, like a shopping center, and they set up camp in the courtyard on the um, on the picnic tables there, and they're passing out leaflets protesting a movement by the United Nation that involves Israel. Hot topic anywhere, anytime. Well, the security guard comes out and says, you guys got to go. You can't do political stuff here. You need to leave. So they will sue. Must be nice to have that much free time and money. They will sue for the right to hand out leaflets at the shopping center. So the shopping center violated our First Amendment rights. Supreme Court ruled, yes, yes, the shopping center did violate your First Amendment rights, because even though it was on private property, you were not interfering. You did not, quote, um, reasonably intrude on the rights of the private property owners. You did not unreasonably intrude on the right of the private property owners. Thus, they can't stop you from doing this on their property. Hmm, Facebook, Twitter, and all that stuff. If you're a good lawyer, you can probably grab this and run with it. But remember, y'all signed an agreement to follow their rules. And that makes it tricky. We got another court case, Packingham versus North Carolina. Packingham was a registered sex offender for having taken, quote, indecent liberties with minors, unquote. He did his 10 to 12 month prison sentence, uh, followed by a 24 month supervised release, was on a sex offender list, banned from contact with minors. But then in 2010, his parole officer caught him on Facebook and was like, oh my gosh, he could be accessing children on Facebook. So he'll be, he'll be arrested for breaking the terms of uh, the sex offender terms of the state of North Carolina. He'll appeal, it'll go to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court will have a split decision, five to three. Neil Gorsuch will sit this one out. I'm not sure what the details behind that is, but he did. And five of them will say, to say you can't get on the internet, no, we, we can't take that risk. The freedom of speech is too important in America. The free exchange of ideas, uh, it's worth the risk of you contacting a child. We, we can't block the Internet. Now, three of the judges, uh, Justice Roberts, Justice Alito, and um, one more that I'd figure out if I'd look at my paper. I'm trying to do this from memory for you. Said, no, 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 no. At some point, the state has to be able to regulate this stuff. And they introduced the thought that the new public square the new public forum is now online. We're gonna spend more time talking to each other on social media than we're gonna spend in face-to-face -face contact out there. We no longer get up on soapboxes and make speeches and political campaigns, we put it all on social media. So thus, history and technology have shifted what we originally focused free speech on to a whole different area. And since that is a private enterprise, it's gotta be protected and treated differently. And they introduced this thought of regulation because free speech is now digital. Speech is now digital. Well, that should be fun. The uh, American Bar Association actually published an article about this recently. They have a magazine called the Human Rights Magazine in volume 43, magazine number four. There's an article about the First Amendment and how it should apply how we should expand the definition of First Amendment to digital and not just verbal and written. Technology has us a new platform. Oh, if we've got to consider it, it's time to upgrade, according to the American Bar Association. Let me read you a couple of lines off of that. The First Amendment only limits governmental actors, federal, state, and local. But there are good reasons why this should be changed. Certain powerful private entities, particularly social networking sites such as Facebook and Twitter and others, can limit, control, and censor speech as much or more than governmental entities. Because let's face it, who's listening to the government anymore? Everything we're doing is instantaneous online. It, the private platforms of exchange are what's controlling our free speech now. But you agreed, and it's privately owned. So now we have a clash of constitutional issues and legal and federal law and issues. So it's going to take a little while to sort some of this stuff out. The trend currently is moving in the direction of opening up these platforms in court and forcing them to give the same freedoms as the constitutional amendments would, such as freedom of speech cannot be abridged. Let me read you another paragraph out of here real quick. The first justification, the marketplace of ideas, 
as a pervasive metaphor in First Amendment law that says the government should not distort the market or engage in content control of any concepts, of any thoughts, of any ideas, put it out in the marketplace. As John Milton said in his book in 1644, quote, let truth and falsehood grapple. Whoever knew truth put to the worst in a free and open encounter. When have you known truth to lose? I could probably think of one or two. But anyway, there is some precedent on the state level of a movement in this direction. When we get to the case of Mazda Brook Commons Homeowners Association versus Kahn, New Jersey Supreme Court. Kahn has been censored by the Homeowners Association. And he says, it's my First Amendment right for free speech. Mazda Homeowners Association says, no, private property, you signed an agreement. Supreme Court ruled that there are some cases where even if I signed an agreement and it is in a private group, First Amendment exchange of ideas, that marketplace of exchange is way more important than your private group's rules. And the Supreme Court of New Jersey has overturned the ruling and granted the rights and protected the rights of free speech for Mr. Kahn. Will that hit the U.S. Supreme Court and expand out through precedents to the social media? Who knows? But it certainly would appear that society is moving that way. The wheels of justice turn slowly. It's just going to take a while to sort this stuff out. Meanwhile, I recommend, and this is just me speaking personally, I recommend you go back and read the terms of the agreements that you agreed to in order to access the platform. And if you don't agree with them, then don't agree with them. Otherwise, you agreed to it. You signed your name to their rules and put your future and your speech in their hands. That, that's how the cookie crumbles. Hope you all have a good day.